In the last meeting, we talked about creation and what scientists say. So we learned about that, how they're a little off. God said everything's been here for a little over 6,000 years, and they say it's about a billion years, but they're, they're a little bit off from the Lord, okay? So, just a little. But last week, before I even started, last week I wanna, I, I'm going to read these scriptures right here. We need to believe the Word of God. We need to believe what we read in the Bible. Because in 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. All Scripture. Everything you read in the Bible is given by the inspiration of God. Man did not write this. They were inspired by God what to write. They did not do it on their own. So these are the words of God. And this is the way we need to look at it. If He inspired these words to be here, then they're perfect. These are perfect words here. There's no mistakes in the Bible. There's no contradictions in the Bible. God wrote it. It is perfect. And we need to believe that. Also in Second Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, he says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. No private... Man should not take the Scriptures and say, Well, this is what I think it says. God said, No. Nah. It's not for private interpretation. It's not for you to think what it says. It's for you to study and hear what I have to say. So if you don't, if you don't know and you don't know for sure of what the Scripture says, then don't teach it. Don't preach it. Don't teach it. You don't teach or preach a, a, a verse in the Bible until God has shown you what that verse, what it means. That's why it says, Scriptures are not up for private interpretations. We have enough of that. <clears throat> We got enough preachers and teachers out there who are giving their private interpretation. We got teachers out there that shouldn't even be teachers. Well, we got preachers out there that shouldn't even be preachers. They weren't led by the Lord. Verse 21 says, For prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Men of God speak when they're moved by the Holy Spirit. That's what men of God do. God uses man to speak to us. He uses his words to speak to us. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. We need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps us, helps us to search the Scriptures and to understand them. So we need the Holy Spirit. And who is the Holy Spirit? The Lord God. Amen. 1 Thess Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, it says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in the truth, the word of God, which is effectively worketh also in you that believe. So once the word gets in you, once you hear the word, it starts to work in us. And how's that working in us? We start to live by the scripture. What we read, what the Lord gives us, we start living that way. That's how it works in us. Amen. We don't just read the scriptures. If you just read the scriptures and you let it go one ear and not the other, you're wasting your time. Study the scriptures. Let the scriptures penetrate your heart. Then you'll see a change in your life. Amen. Amen. And like I've always said, Amos 3.3, 3, God said, Can two walk together except they be even agreed? How can you walk with the Lord if you don't agree with the Scriptures? Even one or two of them. If you don't, agree, if you don't believe a Scripture or two, that's enough to say, you can't walk with me. you got to be totally, totally dependent on the words of God. Every word He says. Every word. If there's anything in here you like, you have questions about, you done blew it. You can't walk with God. You've got to be in total agreement with Him, with the Scriptures. And that's what we're doing when we are looking, studying this about creation and what scientists say. Totally different. Totally different. My daughter was at the lake this weekend. Uh, there were some other people there. And she called me and she said, Daddy, this, there's a lady here saying that animals can communicate with us and they, they know what we're thinking and, and they're, they're, we're just like the animals and, 
And then she started talking about the stars, how the stars speak to us and gives us signs. And I told my daughter, I said, you need to get away from that person right now. This is not a person of God. You need to get away from her. She's several hundred miles away, but she called me because she knows she can call her dad. And I told her what to do, and she listens. If her dad says that's not good, then she knows, okay, I'm not listening to her. Amen? At least she does that. Thank you, Lord. So last week it was said that scientists are saying that creation is still continuing. It's still evolving. And we saw that God said He was finished. He was finished creating everything. We saw that last week. And that He rested. And, he, and that He didn't. He rested on the seventh day. And like I said, He didn't rest because He was tired because all He was doing was speaking. He wasn't doing anything physical, making things. All He said, He was speaking it by the Word. And it was created. So He wasn't tired. Like I said, I showed you that it meant we are to rest on the seventh day. He made these bodies. He made these bodies to work six days out of seven. He made these bodies. So he knows what these bodies can do. So he said, well, let me be an example to them. Let me rest on the seventh day so that way they can see, well, if my God rested the seventh day, then I need to rest the seventh day. And we need to follow that. Now let me show you in the New Testament what it says about creation being finished. I showed you in the Old Testament, let me show you in the New Testament. Colossians 1.16 It says, For by Him were all things created that are in the heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. Now the key word in these verses is were. The word were is a past tense. He's done this already. He's done it. He's not saying all things are still being created. He didn't put the word still in there. He said they were created. Everything was already created. They're not continuing because he uses the word were. Also, if we look at these verses, at the, at the end of this verse, at the end of the verse where it says, all things were created by him and for him, we were created by God. And it says right here, we were created for him. We were created for God. We were. So our purpose in life is to live for the Lord. That's our purpose in life. Because He created us. He didn't create us to be sinful and wicked. Everything He created was good, right? So He made us to be good. But God created us for Him. For Jesus. So there's people walking around. They don't want to believe in Him. In fact, some people say there's not even a God. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. And that's going to happen. That's going to happen. God's going to say, hey, I made you. I made you. But you ignored me. You didn't want me. So this is what I have for you. Another place in the Bible where the devil used the scientist <clears throat> is in the book of uh, Jonah. The scientist says, they say there's a well that swallowed Jonah. Is a myth. Wells can't swallow a whole man. If God said the well swallowed Jonah, a man, then that's what happened. Because it can happen. I mean, it's, it's been found that a, a sperm whale, I think it's called, has been known to swallow a 16-foot shark. If they, can follow, if they can swallow a 16-foot shark, then I'm sure they can swallow a man. So it's, it's true. It, they, it can happen, but, you know... You got people out there, oh, it's impossible, it can't happen. Now, those are people who are, who, he, he, they just don't want people to look at the Word of God. No, no, listen to me, I can tell you, it, it, this can't happen. That's just a myth, that's just a story. No. And the reason they do that is because in Matthew chapter 12, verse 39 and 40, But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of prophet of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. They want it. That's why they're saying whales cannot swallow a man. Because if, they, if we believe that, then we can believe this. Then we can believe that Jesus went to hell. He went to hell. It's paradise. When he died, he went to hell which was called paradise and prison. He preached to the ones in prison 
and the ones in Sheol, the ones in paradise, when he went up to heaven, they followed him. But he did go down there for three days, just like Jonah did in the belly of the well. But they said that's not true, so they can kind of prove, well, this is not true either. There's no way Jesus went to hell for, th for three nights and then rose again. So that's why they're saying that can't happen, so, so they can show this isn't possible. Just like that wasn't possible. That's how I'm, I hear what I'm saying? In the book of Jonah, the well, God called a well a fish. What do scientists, what do men call whales? They call whales a mammal. A whale is not a mammal. A, man, a whale is a fish. God said it's a fish. He also, in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 11 through 18, the Lord called the bat, he called the bat a bird. Men call the bat a mammal. You see why we need to read the Bible? If we read the Bible, then when someone says, oh, a bat's a mammal. Uh, no, it's not. Or the whale's a mammal. No, it's not. My God said a whale's a fish. My God said a, pat, a bat is a bird. Not a mammal. Since we're talking about a whale, let's see what the Bible says about these big animals. Let's see if the scientists are true. Because they believe in dinosaurs. Let's check the words of God out. So let's see if there were that in dinosaurs. As we read these verses, we'll see that they have... <clears throat> these next verses we're going to be reading, we're going to see they have a spiritual meaning also. We're going to be reading about a big, mighty animal. But these all... Like I said, it's going to have a spiritual meaning behind it also. So pay attention. The word serpent and dragon are used in the scriptures meaning the devil, right? When you see serpent or dragon, it's talking about the devil. We'll see that when we get to Job 41, chapter 41, verse 34, you'll be able to see spiritually what this is talking about when we get there. We'll also see that he created them at the same time. He made man and he also made the big animals at the same time. We've, we've, we've read that already. These powerful animals, they all ate grass. Everybody ate grass before Noah. Animals, men, we ate herbs, we ate vegetables. That's what we ate. In Isaiah 27.1, it speaks about dragons. I didn't put those down, so you might write that down. Isaiah chapter 27, verse 1, speaks about dragons. Well, now we're going to be reading Job 41, verses 19 through 21, where it says, it talks about a fire dragon. And also in Isaiah 30, verse 6, it speaks about a fire, fire, a fire flying serpent or dragon. These are in the scriptures. So in Job, chapter 40, verse 15 through 24, I'm going to read. Behold now, behemoth, which I made thee, with thee. See, he made this big animal, he made it with thee. He's talking about meant to men. So he made this big animal, which we're going to see, it's a dinosaur. But he made this dinosaur with thee, meaning with man. He used the grass as an ox. This is one thing we're going to tell the scientists. Uh, no, dragons weren't here millions of years ago. They were here the same time we were here, God said. They were here the same time we were created. This animal is one that we don't know much about. Because the scriptures, in the scriptures, describes, uh, the Lord describes it as a pretty powerful, mighty animal. And uh, I believe it's in the West, West Webster Dictionary. It, uh, it has this word in there, behemoth. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right. But behemoth. Behemoth. Muhammad. It says it's a hippopotamus. They say this animal is a hippopotamus. Well, let's read the scriptures. Verse 16. Lo, now, his strength, we're talking about this animal, his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moves his tail like a cedar. His sinews of his stones are wrapped together. Now, you tell me of any hippopotamus that you've seen that has a tail like a cedar tree. Now, anybody knows anything about hippopotamus? Their tails are little, yeah. little curly things. Yeah, and right here it says the tail of this, this animal he has a tail like a cedar tree so he, or, so is he talking about a hippopotamus here I don't know where the dictionary got that they're, they're, that this is a, a hippopotamus 
I guess, like again, again, like I always say, I guess these people just don't read the scriptures. Verse 18. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. <clears throat> the Lord says that this animal is the biggest and strongest he's made. That's how big this animal is. And it says only God can handle him. We're going to see in the, the rest of the verses, we can't handle this animal. We cannot tame him. We can't do anything with him. Verse 20. Surely the mountains bring him forth food for all the beasts of the field play. He lieth under shady trees in the comfort of the seed and fins. The shady trees cover him with their shadows. The willows of the brook compass him about. Behold, he drinketh up a river and hastes not. He trusteth that he can draw up Jordan into his mouth. That's a pretty big animal. He can, he can just about drink a river up. It says the Jordan River overflows. It gets up to his mouth and that's no problem for him. He's so big if when the river overflows and it's up to his mouth, he, he just drinks it up. We're talking about a big animal. Right? I mean, we, we've seen nothing like that. That's why I believe this has to be a dinosaur. It has to be. In verse 24, He taketh it with his eyes, his nose pierceth through snares. No one can catch this animal. No one. That's what, all these verses, that's what he's, this animal is so big, no one can tame him, no one can catch him. Now here's another animal. We'll read about this animal. and uh, Again, they say this animal is a, a crocodile. Let's read the verses. We're going to be reading Job chapter 41. Verses 1 through 11. Canst thou draw out the fine fan with a hook, or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Canst thou put a hook into his nose, or bore his jaw through with a, with a thorn? Again, it's saying you can't hook this animal. This animal is so big you can't hook him. Verse 3. Will he make any supplications on the, unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? Will he make a covenant with thee? Would thou take him for a servant forever? Will thou play with him as with a bird? Or wilt thou bind him for thy maiden? Shall the compassion make a banquet of him? Shall they port him among the merchants? Canst thou fill his skin with board iron? Or his head with fish spears? Lay thy hand upon him. Remember the battle. Do no more. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? It's trying to say, if you even try to battle this animal, you're going to fail. Not only are you going to fail, but you're not even going to try it again. You're going to be too scared to try it again. That's what it's saying. Your hope to catch this animal, like I said, is just in vain. You can't do it. That's how big this animal. What animal do we have nowadays in this earth that man can't catch and tame? Well, maybe not tame them, but can't catch. I don't know of any animal that they can't catch today. But with this, these two animals, God said, they cannot, no man can tame or catch these animals. That's what he's saying. Now, this is the book of Job. In the book of Job, you know, Job went through a lot of trials. A lot of trials. And God's telling them, you know, all of a sudden he's talking about these two big animals. Just like that, he starts talking about these, these, these big creatures. How mighty they are, how strong they are. And the reason he's doing that, he's telling Job, Look, Job, you're blaming me for this, and you're blaming me for that. These animals, you can't even, no man can tame them. Nobody can even come close to, uh, to catching them. And he's saying, Job, I created those animals. And if I can create those mighty animals, who do you think I am? I have to be God. No man can. Train. No man can catch these animals, and I'm the one who made them, and I can handle them. So Job, that's how big I am. That's what. He's, that's why he went to this. We're talking about Job, but Job is not a book about animals. But he was showing them. He was using these scriptures here to show Job. That's how big of a God I am. What y'all can't tame, what y'all can't catch, I created. I can. Verse ten. None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before? me. 
If no one can stand before these animals the Lord is saying, then who can stand against the Lord? If you can't even stand against what I've created, how are you going to stand against me? That's what God is telling Job. Verse 11, Who hath prevented me that I should repay him? Whatsoever is under the whole of heaven is mine. I'm going to say that again, that last part of the verse. Whatsoever is under the, the whole heaven, whatever is under heaven is mine. That's what God said. Did, did you hear? I mean, do you know what he's saying there? God is saying it's mine. I owe no one because everything is mine. Everything we have is from the Lord. Do we know that by now? Shouldn't we know that by now? Everything that we have is from God. God has given it to us. You know, are you smart? Are you an intelligent person? Well, if you are, guess who gave you those brains? The Lord did. So can you take credit because I'm such an intelligent, I'm so smart? No. God gave you those brains. You have a nice house? God gave you that house. Everything is the Lord's. Everything. We cannot take credit for anything. Look what I did. And so many of us do that. We do that a lot. Many Christians do that. You got a lot of money? Where'd you get that money from? The Lord got it for you. He got you the job to make that money. Or He gave you the brains to go to school so you can be that doctor or that lawyer. It's still His. It all came from Him. Because you went to school, you went to college and studied, that's good. But He gave you the brains to do it. Everything's the Lord. Everything. we got to open our eyes and see that. Everything is the Lord's. We should give ourselves no credit. All credit goes to the Lord. If I have anything, if I have a brain, thank you, Lord. If I, if I have eyes that I can see, thank you, Lord. None of this stuff, we should not take all this for granted. If you can even speak, thank you, Lord. If you can hear, thank you, Lord. If you can walk. All this, this is not for, I mean, we take it for granted. But these are all blessings to the Lord. Because how many people are out there who don't have these blessings? That don't have them. So we need to learn how to give the Lord all the credit for everything. For everything we have. Now you have people who take the credit. You have people who do that. Oh, this money, I made this money. I'm the one who built this and blah, blah, blah. You know what you call these people? Idiots. That's what you call them. It's God... God. God said everything's mine. And if there's any idiots out there, if the shoe fits, wear it. Let's drop down to verse 19. But first, people, the rest of the verses is going to speak about this big animal, a fire pin, <clears throat> how powerful it is. And we'll also see that this animal is a fire breathing dragon. That's what we're going to see in verses 19 and 321. It says, we're talking about that Lephiah man. Out of his mouth go burning lamps. And sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils go with smoke, as out of a <clears throat> seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindles coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. That's a fire breathing dragon. Sounds like a dragon to me. I mean, come on, that's what it's saying. Not only here, but in Isaiah. Chapter 27, verse 1, it says, In that day the Lord with his sword and a great strong sword shall punish Lephiathan, the piercing serpent, even Lephiathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. We know it comes from the sea because verse 15, it says it had scales. So this animal is, is, is a fish, but it's a flying a flying dragon who can go in the water because it's got scales. Verse 15 says it had scales. We didn't read it, but if you want to go back, it's in verse 15. <clears throat> also in Isaiah 30, verse 6, it says that this Leviathan also is a fire flying serpent. So not only can it go in the water, but it can fly. But these are the scriptures. That's why those scriptures I read at the beginning, that these are the words of God. It's up to us if we're going to take that for real. It's up to us if we're going to, like I said, if there's one verse in here you don't believe, then you can't walk with the Lord. So if you're thinking, well, oh, no, 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 that's kind of crazy. I mean, really, dragons, fire-breathing dragons? I mean, I saw that on cartoons 
right movies. No, they were for real. God made them. God said how big and powerful they were, and God made these. Now let's look at this spiritually. It says, in that day the Lord, when it says that in that verse, it's speaking about the day of the Lord. When it says, in that day the Lord. The Lord is coming, the Lord is going to come and put down this serpent, this dragon. They're the same. The Lord says he's going to come down and He's going to come back and put these, the dragon and the serpent down. In verse, jo, I mean, jo, Job 41:34. this is what I'm talking about. He beholdeth all high things. He is a king. He's talking about this devil, this uh, dragon. He is a king over all the children of pride. Children of pride, that's people who, that's people who don't want to live for the Lord. Because they want to do things their way. That's what it's talking about. The children of pride. It's talking about lost people. And right here it says this animal is the king over these children of pride. Now who's the king over the over the lost people? The devil. The devil. He's the prince of power of the earth, right? Of the air. All those who are lost, he's king over them. So that's what I'm saying. This animal, this the dinosaur is talking about right here in verse 34 of chapter 41 of Job. He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. This is the devil. This animal that represents the devil is, is mighty. He says right how mighty he is. And he is if you let him be. This is a mighty animal. This is the devil. And he will control your life. And he will have total power over you if you let him. Lost people... Lost people, they can't lift a finger to him. Well, all this thing is said about men can't do this and men can't catch it or can't do this to it. That's right. Lost people can't touch the devil. But we Christians, who, we, who do we have on our side? This monster, this dragon, this devil can't touch us. Man, I should have heard more than one amen. <laughs> Everybody should have said that. Amen. Amen. Do we know how the devil is and how strong he is? He's mighty. But to me, to me, he's a wimp. He's a wimp. I don't fear the devil. I used to. And if I ever get to where I get scared, all I have to do is pray. Lord, fill me with the Spirit. Because the devil cannot be where the Spirit is. Cannot. Impossible. That's all we have to do. We need to learn to do that. When we have fear, and fear comes from the devil, fear of the Lord is means means to respect. Okay? So we don't we're not supposed to fear our God. You might think I'm crazy for believing the word of God. No, no, you might not think that. If someone thinks hey, you're you're an idiot. I'm an idiot for the Lord, amen. <laughs> When I gave my life to the Lord, like I said, when I gave my life to the Lord, I said, I am going to believe everything in the Bible. Everything. Every word. And I do. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6, it says, But without faith, it is impossible to please God. So how can you please, please Him if you don't have faith in His words? I have faith that everything that God says is real. If he says there's five reading dragons out there used to be, I believe it. Amen? Amen. You want to think I'm crazy? That's, that's a blessing. I'll say thank you. <laughs> now we're going to go to chapter 2 of Genesis. We were in Genesis 1. Now we're going to go to chapter 2. I just wanted to point out those, uh, what scientists say about dragons and all that. That dragons were here, but they were like here way before us. That one verse says, God said, I made this animal with you. So what does that tell us? God made this dragon the same time he made us. So are the scientists right or wrong? wrong. Totally wrong. They were not here million, millions of years before us. God made us at the same time. Now Genesis chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 4 through 7. It's going to, 4 through 7 is going to, is going to kind of review chapter 1. Verse 4, These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. 
and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it was, it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. Now the last part of this verse it says that God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. Adam didn't have to till the ground, not yet. He didn't have to till the ground until he sinned. And after he sinned, one of his punishments was, God said, now you're going to have to till the ground. Before, before Adam, he, he was perfect. Before he sinned, he was perfect. He was like Jesus. Jesus come in the flesh. God come in the flesh. He wasn't God. Don't get me wrong. He was not God. But he was like Jesus, the man. Without sin. It hadn't rained yet because everything... Everything grew by the mist, the mist of the earth. We see that uh, in the next verse. We'll see that. The purpose of the rain <clears throat> was to flood the earth, which we'll see that later. But verse 6, it says, Because it didn't rain, but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. That's why it never rained. Everything grew by the mist that came up out of the ground. Just like, you, like I said, in the morning when you wake up, your grass is all wet. That's the mist. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. God said that man was formed from the dust of the ground. Man didn't evolve from an animal. Now remember, this teaching is what do scientists say? What does God say? Right here he plainly says we come from the ground. And he breathed in us breath of life. In verse 19 it says, Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast. Scientists so say that animals were, <coughs> were formed from this and that. This, all these words they use, I don't even know them, but scientists' words. This is how animals were made, blah, blah, blah. Well, God says right here how animals were made. They came from the ground. So God formed man and animal from the ground. That's what we read, right? I guess women are special. Men from the ground. Animals were formed, was, was formed by the ground. Women were formed by what? The rib of the man. He didn't create women out of the ground, out of dirt. Now, I, I, now for sure I hear the women go, Amen. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, I'm glad I'm not dirt. Well, I guess we are. We were, we were from the ground. So he made the woman out of the rib of Adam. When God breathed life in, into him, he became a living soul, it says. We were alive until Adam sinned. After Adam and Eve sinned, that's when death came in. Because God said, you, if you do this, you will surely die. Well, we did, spiritually. Not physically, but spiritually we did. We were no longer alive. We no longer had life. Luke 9, 60. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. So God's telling the dead, people, living people, but they're dead because they don't have the Lord. Let the dead go bury their dead. That's what Jesus said. He's calling living people, dead people. He's calling them dead. Because they're not, they don't have the Lord in them. Second Corinthians 5.14 For the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge that he, excuse me, that he, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. So be, before he died for all of us, we were all what? Dead. We were all dead. We're all dead. Nobody has life until they give their life to the Lord. Nobody. Until you give your heart to the Lord, we are dead. We don't. Jesus said, "I am the, <clears throat> I am the life." And He is. When you accept Him into your heart, then you got life. Ephesians two one. And you hath He quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. So God says right here, He made you alive who were dead in your sins. So we were dead. Everybody that you know that's not a born-again Christian is a dead person. Not physically, but spiritually. They're dead. In God's eyes, they're dead. They're zombies. 
and they won't have life until, accept, until they accept the Lord in their heart. This is what the scriptures I'm showing. I'm giving you the scriptures right here, showing that people who don't know how, who do not have the Lord Jesus Christ in their heart, I'm showing you, they're dead. In 1978, in the Houston Chronicle, a scientist, Dr. Niles Eltridge, he says, in in the in the, in the Houston Chronicle, he says, the search for the missing link to show we that we're from apes are probably fruitless because probably it never existed. This link never existed. Now, this is a scientist. He said it probably never existed. But we keep looking anyway. This is what he says. But we're going. But we're seeing here is that even the evolutionists are are giving up. But they still want to. They still won't give God the credit of how everything started. I mean, this is a scientist. He gave up right here. You know, he said this is fruitless. There is no missing. If, if there was one, we would have found it. He said there is no missing one. All the fossil evidence that is up to date has failed to show any missing link between man and animals. All the fossil evidence they're collecting today, they still haven't got anything to connect them together. And this is a scientist, now Eldridge, he finally came to his senses, but he still didn't give the Lord credit. So we see that scientists cannot find what they're supposed to be looking for to prove their point. They can't find it. I mean, we're in 2015. That's a lot of years for scientists to be looking for a missing link and can't find it. I mean, when do you give up? I mean, this scientist did. He finally gave up. But like I said, he didn't give the Lord the credit. Scientists can prove it in a book. They can prove it on paper. Oh, well, if you do this or do that, or if you look at this this way, it's all their theories and, you know, it's all... They can show it on paper, but they can't show it out in nature. They can't prove it out there. And that's a big difference when you can... You can show something in the book, okay, I see it there, but then you go out there, you can't prove it. See what I'm saying? You can almost prove anything if you write down this and that, put it together, oh, I see... But now prove it to me in real life. Can't do it. So, the bottom line, like I said last time, the bottom line, believe God or man. If there's anyone out there who, who is a scientist, and I'm, like I said, I'm not talking about scientists. Uh, the, the scientists I'm talking about are scientists who believe that we've been here a million years. The scientists I'm talking about are ones who believe we evolved from apes or animals. Those are the ones I'm talking about. You can't believe in that and be a Christian. You can't. How can two walk together unless they be in agreement? If they do not believe the Word of God that He created everything this way and this is how long it took, if they cannot accept that, then they cannot walk with the Lord. So if there's any scientists out there that believes that way, do not, do not, say you believe in God because you're a liar. Mm -hmm. 